we're going to talk about monads. Monads are a nice abstract way of talking about various algebraic theories. You can use monads to describe the theory of groups, for example, the theory of monoids, the theory of categories, the theory of various things. And monads give us a way of talking about all those things and understanding them in a particular way. Now, if we're not going to be talking about a particular group or a particular monoid or a particular category, that will come in later when we look at algebras for monads. And the slogan we can have here is that monads are like algebraic theories, and an algebra for a monad is a model of that theory. So let's see what the definition is. A monad is given as an octa on a particular category. First, you have to say what category you're working in, together with some extra stuff that tell us what's going on in that theory. So let's have the definition of a monad. A monad is given by, well, first of all, after from a category C to itself, so this is an endocrater, and it's equipped with two natural transformations. With natural transformations, eta, which goes from the identity functor to T, I'm writing it as a double arrow because it's a natural transformation, and nu, which goes from T squared to T. And this is called the unit. And this is called the multiplication. And I hope you can hear me above that siren that's outside. Now let's just look at what this does on components, because it's a natural transformation, so of course that means that for every object in the category C, it has a component which is a morphism. So eta, the component of eta at the object x, is a morphism in C that goes from x to T of x. And what's about mu? The component of mu at x is a morphism in C that goes from T squared of X to T of X. Now, of course, this has to satisfy some axioms, and when you're a hardened category theorist, like we're going to be, you say it satisfies the obvious axioms. Well, let's actually say what those axioms are, and hopefully later on you'll be able to understand why they are these so-called obvious axioms. Well, there are, there are two axioms. There are unit axioms and associativity axioms. They might not at first look like ordinary unit and associativity axioms that you know, but Again, that's another thing that hopefully will become clear later. So let's see, the first, the unit axioms, so these are such that the following diagrams commute. Let's start with the unit. First you can, the first, the, you can start with t, and you can go over to t squared in two different ways. You can either do eta on the right, or you can do eta on the left. And after you've got yourself to t squared, you can then do mu to get back down to t again. And the point is that that's supposed to be the identity. And what about, what about for mu? We have an associativity axiom that says if you start with t cubed, there are two things you can do. You can either do mu on the left, or you can do mu on the right. And both of those take you down to t squared. And once you're at t squared, there's only one thing you can do, which is mu. So you do mu. And so this square starts at t cubed, gives you two ways of going down to t, and says that both of those have to be the same thing. So these are called the, the left and right unit triangle, unit triangle, and this is called the associativity square. Associativity square. Now, in case you're not used to seeing diagrams of natural transformations like that, of course, what's a diagram of natural transformations? Well, you can do it on components, because a natural transformation is made up of these morphisms, which are the components. And saying that this diagram of natural transformations commutes is precisely saying that on components, the diagram on components commutes. So I can rewrite this, which I'm, I'm just going to rewrite it literally now, saying what it means on components. So this one says that if you start with t of x, and you do t of eta of x, then to t squared of x, here that says now eta t on components is the component of eta at t of x. So after that, you do mu of x. This is the identity morphism on x. That's the identity morphism on x. So this is now an honest-to-god commutative diagram in the category C. And we can do the same thing to this one over here. You put x in everywhere. Oops, sorry. Now, oh, I did something wrong here. That was supposed to be a mu on the right. And nobody corrected me. 
so mu t, the component of x, is the component of mu at t of x, and this here is t of mu of x, and this is mu of x, and this is mu of x. So that is the definition of a monad. So now, let's quickly have a look at one example, a key example of a monad, so that we can see what kind of thing happens here. Example, we probably won't have time to go into the full details now, but hopefully it will give you some idea of how monads encapsulate the theory of something. So we'll take something nice and straightforward here, the theory of monads. You usually think to yourself, well, what is a the theory of monads? The theory of monoids. A monoid is a set equipped with a multiplication satisfying uh, units of associativity laws. So let's try and express this as a monad. Example, the monad for monoids. Now we're calling it the monad for monoids because what's later going to happen, we're not supposed to know this yet, but secretly I'll tell you that the algebras for this monad are going to be monoids. Of course, we don't know what algebras for a monad are yet, so I wasn't supposed to say that. But this is going to be a monad on what category? Well, what, how did I just give the definition? I said it's a set, a monoid is a set equipped with some stuff. So the category we're working in is category set. We've got to define the functor. The functor is, well, how do you define a functor? You say what it does on objects. So we've got to take a set and we've got to send it to some other set, which I'm going to write as x star. And it's the set of words in x, the set of words in X. What's a word in X? It's a list of the objects of X, a finite list. It could be an empty list. So, for example, you might have X1, X2, X3. You can also have the empty list, which is a bit of a strange list. I wish all my shopping lists were empty. Um, but it's a very important list because, of course, it's going to give us the identity, um, the, the unit for the monoid. Now, to finish defining this, we now we can extend this to a functor. What we've got to do is define the eta and the mu, the, the unit and the multiplication for this monad. So what's eta going to be? Well, eta of x, remember, is a morphism, so it's a, a function going from x to t of x, which is x star. So we take an object of x, we have to send it to some list of elements of x. Now, what can we possibly do? All we've got is one element. So we just have a one element list. So it's the word of length one consisting of just x all by itself. Not a very interesting list, but a very important one nonetheless. And then we have to define the natural transformation mu. Mu of x goes from x t squared of x, which is x star star, and it's a function to x star. So what's x star star? Well, it's words in words in x. So it's a list of lists. So here's a list of lists. A, B, C, comma, B, E, comma, F. So how can we possibly turn that into just one list? Well, you just delete these brackets. So this is just a case of deleting the inside brackets, and you get one long list, A, B, C, D, E, F. So that's what the multiplication is. Now, next time we'll see what on earth it is these axioms say, but here's something to be aware of, which is that the unit and the associativity axioms do not correspond to the unit and the associativity of the monoid. The unit and the associativity of the monoid has been coded into the definition of this functor already. You can perfectly well have a monad for non-unital, non-associative things. And later, next time, we'll see how that's the case. So don't get confused about the fact that these are unit and associativity. Next time, we'll see what those axioms are actually saying for this case. And we'll probably have a look at how the algebras for this thing give us monoids.